Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Let's give ourselves just a little bit of time for some review. And then we will open up the text here, beginning with chapter 7 and verse 4. If you have your Bibles, I would ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. As you can see by the screen behind me, we are in this larger heading of the seven seals that are cut open by the Lamb before the throne. We saw that description for us in Revelation chapter 5. We have seen already the first four seals that were split open back in chapter 6 in the first eight verses. We also saw that fifth seal cut open and revealed for us those martyred saints in Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11. And then Roman numeral 3, the sixth seal revealing those cosmic devastations found in Revelation 6, verses 12 12 through 17. Chapter 7 provides for us somewhat of an interlude. Uh, We would expect that when we get to verse 1 of chapter 7, that the seventh seal would be split open. But that is not the case. We are given different information. We are presented in chapter 7 with a vision of two groups, or at least two visions of, of two groups. The first of these we found in Roman numeral 4, the 144,000 of Israel that are sealed. That's chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. And it is to this particular section that we are giving our attention tonight. We have already looked at the first three verses, and very simply, by way of review, let's look at them. Letter A. We saw this withholding of these winds of destruction. This is our lesson from last week, those first three verses. Let's read those verses for review. Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And so we came to number one under letter A last week. Four angels, four corners, and four winds. That's verse one. There are four angels, and they hold back these Four winds of the earth. And we shared last week, we, we spent a good deal of time dealing with God's sovereignty over creation. God's sovereignty over this atmosphere. That it is God who has control over these things. God has sovereign control over all things. Nothing moves apart from his de- command, apart from his decree. We spent a good deal of time last week dealing with that. And this is just one example of that. That God is the one who controls these things. It is Christ Jesus who stands up in the boat in a storm and cries out to the winds, peace, be still. And I shared with you a quote from a gentleman by the name of Bruce Ware. You may know him, you may not. He is professor of Christian theology at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville. Uh, He says this, God exhaustively plans and meticulously carries out his perfect will as he alone knows is best. And then you have this threefold description of that, God's sovereignty. Regarding all that is in heaven and on earth, that speaks of God's universal sovereignty. And he does so without failure or defeat. That speaks of God's absolute sovereignty. Sovereignty, accomplishing his purposes in all of creation from the smallest details to the grand purposes of his plan for the whole of the created order. That speaks of the immutability of God's sovereignty. We had quotes last week also from Charles Hodge. You may remember that. I don't have it on the screen tonight. But these angelic beings, these angelic beings in obedience to the sovereign control of God, hold back the winds so that, in order that, that's a purpose clause, so that no wind might blow on the earth 
or against any sea or against any tree. The text is telling us that some kind of destruction is looming on the horizon. It says that no wind will blow. There will be a deathly stillness, possibly something akin to being in the eye of a hurricane. I do not know. I simply know that it says that there will be this stillness of some kind. Verse 2 speaks of this ascending angel. This ascending angel in verse 2. He has the seal of God in his hand. And he speaks with some degree of authority because he commands these other angels to do something. What is that? To withhold these winds until certain individuals are sealed. That brings us to verse 3, and that is his directive, saying to these four angels in Revelation 7-3, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And so there seems to be here this description that God is going to withhold these winds of destruction because it says don't harm, bring no harm to these things. So they they appear to be winds of destruction, whatever they may be. Some people associate them with the six seals. Some people associate them with the seven trumpets or the seven bowls that are poured out. Possibly, I do not know. I just simply know that they have a reference to something that's going to harm the creation, specifically the trees, the sea, and the grass. But the directive is, do not do so until these individuals are sealed. Last week, we spent our last moments together describing God's purposes in sealing individuals. And we came away with these three thoughts. And actually, they are not mine. I borrowed them. Three of the commentators that I follow rather closely. Uh, Greg Beal is a commentator I follow closely. Uh, Robert Thomas uh, is a commentator that I follow closely. And there was another one. I can't think of who it was. But all three of them shared these three thoughts regarding the purposes of God's sealing individuals. One of them is that God's God's sealing indicates his ownership. We belong to God. We are his property. He owns us. So we are his. We are not our own. We are, you finish the verse, we are bought with a price. And that price being not silver, not gold, but the precious blood of the Lamb. All right? A third purpose for sealing is that it indicates certification or authenticity. Not only are we his, but we are genuine. We are the real article. And I shared that there are two sides to that ceiling. There is God's side where he sovereignly elects and knows us because the scripture says, God says, I know those who are mine. And yet the other side of that, on the very, in the very same passage, it says that we are to flee from iniquity. And so you have juxtaposed in one verse God's sovereignty and our responsibility. So we are authenticated by being sealed by that Holy Spirit. And you know, we, we refer to the, what's that doctrine we refer to in the fact that we depart from iniquity, we follow him, that is the perseverance of the saints. We are his by divine election. And it is shown to the world by our obedience to his commands. Thirdly, letter C, this is where we wrapped up last week. This ceiling indicates protection. And it would seem that this is the primary indication for these individuals. It is certainly not the sole indication, but it does seem to be the primary indication because the angel is telling these other four angels, withhold this harm until these individuals are sealed protected, as it were, and then the winds of destruction would be unleashed. That's what we would expect to happen. We don't know. It doesn't say. These four winds, these four angels are not mentioned again. But our assumption is that they are withheld, those winds are withheld, till the individuals are sealed, then the winds blow, the destruction comes. That's last week's lesson. That's our review. Any thoughts on what we've discussed so far in this chapter? Any questions on any of that? If not, then let's go ahead and give our attention to our lesson tonight. I hope you have an outline with you. You might be happy. You might not be happy. That There are no blank lines to fill in tonight. Let's just consider that a gift. All right. This is your June 1st gift. Uh, you don't have to fill in any lines tonight. 
But let's go ahead and look at these 144,000. It is our intention tonight to see if we can't identify these with some degree of certainty. The ceiling of the 144,000. Let's read the verses together, beginning with verse 4. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. 12,000 from the tribe of Asher. 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali. 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon. 12,000 from the tribe of Levi. 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar. 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun. 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph. 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. And so the author goes through great lengths to describe these numbers, giving us an explicit listing of the 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And so we come to this letter B, the sealing of those 144,000. They are referred to in verse 3 as the servants of God. The angel says, withhold these winds until the servants of of God are sealed. That word servant translates the Greek word doulos. Maybe you are familiar with that word if you've been uh, have any acquaintance with the Bible, and maybe that's, that's kind of a word that gets tossed around a good deal uh, in the Greek language, and it just simply means a bond slave. It means a slave. It actually comes from a word that means to tie. And so the idea there is to be tied to someone. It originally was a term that referred to the lowest people on the scale of servitude. However, it came to refer to anyone who gives himself up to the will of another. As you know, language is a bit liquid. Words that meant one thing to us, even in our language, 100, 200 years ago, do not carry the same meaning today. So this is the same thing that goes on. Doulos means really any slave of any kind. And usually it refers to someone who gives himself up to the will of another. And so we, in glad submission to the Lord's call, give ourselves up to him, crying out to him, Lord, You know, you are my master and my king, and I will do as you ask me to do. In the text in Revelation, it tells us that there are 144,000 of these servants, these, whatever the plural is of doulos. There are two questions we ask. Who are they, and how many are they? And you say, well, wait a minute. It says right there who they are, and it says right there how many there are. Oh, but you don't know. You don't know the pages and pages and pages of the various understandings of who these individuals are. Let me give you very briefly some of the main ones. Now, I'm not talking about lunatic French people. I'm talking about people who would, in your estimation and mine, would be considered careful Bible teachers. And I have a position on this passage, and I'll share that with you, but I I hold it humbly. And I show charity to those who may disagree with me. And it's sort of a family disagreement. However, I do have a rather strong position on the passage. And you'll see that when we get to it. First of all, there is the preterist position. You remember we talked about the various ways that people understand revelation. Some of them are what we call preterists. Let me better say that. They are partial preterists. They believe that a good part of revelation was fulfilled in the destruction of of Jerusalem or possibly the final days of the Roman Empire. However, they do not hold that it's something to be in the future or now, but it's something that's taken place in the past. Hence, preterist. It means before. They believe this, that the normative view among evangelical preterists is that the 144,000 is a symbolic number, not to be taken literally, but symbolically and figuratively, Resting the full number of Jewish Christians who escaped Jerusalem before, Jerusalem before its destruction. So, preterists, partial preterists, hold that that 144,000 figurative number representing all of the Jews that were preserved, protected, when Jerusalem fell in 70 A.D. That seems to be the main view. I know there are variations. I know there are others. That seems to be the predominant view. There is, then again, the historicist view. The historicist view would be the view held by 
probably all, if not most, of the reformers, and then subsequently even into those separatists, those Puritans, those separatists, those Baptists of that day, uh, would have held to this position as well. The twelve tribes of Israel and the 144,000 mentioned in them designate respectively Israel, the 12,000 from Israel, and the 144,000. The visible professing church in the Roman Empire, that's the 12 tribes of Israel. And Christ's true church, that's that 144,000. Again, it's a symbolic number. It's not to be taken literally. It's figurative. The election of grace, the saved, who are gathered out of it, right, out of uh, the world into God's church. These these 144,000, which they called the true church, arose after Constantine's conversion and were sealed. He preserved against the barbarian invasions about to be unleashed upon the empire in the first four judgments in the Roman Empire. That's the 12 of Israel. The idealist view. The idealist view would probably be the view that is held by most reformed people of our day. Not all, but a great deal of them. That Revelation is not, to, it is not a book to, to show individual events that happen historically or even in the future. But they are not necessarily events, but things that happen to us. Right? These, they are actualities in our lives. So the idealist would say this. He says, this company represents the church. Again, they do not take the number literally, but figuratively. This company represents the church as the true and spiritual Israel. That God set aside Israel and has grafted in the Gentiles into one true Israel. That the ethnic Israel has been set aside, saved Israel, those Israelites that were converted, people like Paul, people like Peter, people like James, They are the true branches, real, true, spiritual Israel, true sons of Abraham. And then Gentiles brought into that grouping as well, Romans chapter 9, into that one olive tree, the true Israel. The number 144,000 is symbolic, derived by multiplying 1,000, the basic military division in the camp of Israel, that's in your numbers 31, You multiply that by 144, which is 12 squared, symbolizing the faithful remnant of the old Israel and the new Israel, thus forming the true spiritual Israel, the church. So you take those numbers and you do some multiplying and you come up with these things. I want to share with you one thing from a man by the name of William Hendrickson. I really like William Hendrickson. I do not agree with him all the time. This is one of those times I don't. And, folks, I've said this before. You don't know how difficult it is for me to stand here and have to take issue with some great Bible teachers. But on this particular point, I do. However, let me just read to you his statement regarding these 144,000 and see if it rings something in your minds regarding this number. Here's what he writes. And, again, I I love this book. If, If you want a great, small book on Revelation, it's not... It's not detailed, it's not, it doesn't get into any languages, it's very devotional as it were, and will bring out a lot of things in it that are of a great spiritual application. Great volume, I would suggest you buy it. I think you can get it online for $10, 15 something like that. So it would be a good investment. Anyway, this is what he says on this point, and he says this. He says, the number is 144,000. This, of course, is symbolical. Well, he says this, of course, is symbolical. Without any proof, without any, just of course. Well, why of course? It's of course. This of course is symbolic. First, the number three, indicating the Trinity, is multiplied by four, indicating the entire creation. For the sealed ones shall come from the east, the west, the north, and the south. You see the number four representing the earth, because north, south, east, west is how many? Four. Number three, it represents God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three times four makes twelve. This number, therefore, indicates the Trinity, three, operating in the universe, four. When the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit, performs his saving work on the earth, 
the divine three operating in the universe, four, we see in the old dispensation, the twelve, three times four. The old dispensation, what? The twelve patriarchs. And in the new, the twelve apostles. In order to arrive at the conception of the church, of the old and the new dispensation, we shall have to multiply this twelve by twelve. This gives us 144. In order to emphasize the fact that not a small portion of the church is meant, because if you said it was 144, that might indicate a small number, you see. So if you say 12 times 12 is 144, well, if you say just 144, that might make it look like it's a small group. In order to emphasize the fact that not a small portion of the church is meant, but the entire church militant, this number, 144, is multiplied by 1,000. 1,000 is 10 times 10 times 10, which indicates a perfect cube. This is then reduplicated completeness. Okay. Now that from a very small, simple little, <laughs> little book with a lot of application in it. Well, if you can't imagine the pages and pages you have to go through that I skipped over, <laughs> that I did not I don't want you to think I read them all. I did not. But that's the idealist position. It is a figurative number arrived at, depending on who you read, it's arrived at differently, 144,000. Then you have this view, which is called the futurist view. I hold to a futurist view of Revelation. I think that what we are seeing in Revelation is to take place in the future. All right? Now, if I, can confer, if I can further confuse you, forgive me, but allow me to share this. There are a couple of positions regarding futurists. One is known as the dispensationalist position. Dispensationalism. Some of you may know that word, but you don't know what it means. Some of you may know exactly what it means. Basically, what this position holds to is this. That during the Great Tribulation, a godly remnant of 144,000 Jewish people will be sealed for protection from the later plagues. It is taken straight out, literally. Now, their position, the dispensationalist position, is arrived at based on their understanding that God has a separate plan and purpose for Israel and a separate plan and purpose for the church. Right, that's the dispensationalist position. Again, it is, it is not my position, but it, it is a position It is held probably by the majority of evangelicals of our day. A non-dispensational position would probably be, if I'm, I could be wrong, but I think it's in the minority. There is another position in the futurist camp, and that is this position known as historic premillennialism. This is where I would stand. And I believe that... The, in pre, I hold to a premillennial position. That simply means what? That Christ will return pre the millennium. And that there is a literal 1,000 year reign on the earth, Christ reigning, but before that happens, he will return. A premillennial position. All right? Now, again, I'm trying not to be too confusing, and I'm putting it on the board for you. And if you want to jot some of these notes down, I, there might be some room on the back of your sheet. You could do it if you'd like. If, if, if it's important to you, you can write these down. There, is a, there are two positions for the historic pre mill position regarding these 144,000. A. During the Great Tribulation, a godly remnant of 144,000 Jewish people will be sealed for protection from the later plagues. Does that ring a bell to you? But that sounds exactly like the dispensational view, doesn't it? Well, it is. But you don't have to be a dispensationalist to hold to that. That these are, that it's exactly as it says in the text. There is another view. Actually, there are several views. I'm just giving you some of the top ones that are, that are the most dominant. Letter B, a historic pre mill position, is that the 144,000 are symbolic of the church during the days of the tribulation. Historic premillennialists are not necessarily dispensational, but they also believe that the church will go through the, the, uh, the, the tribulation, and this number 144,000 represents 
that group. The whole church. So again, they take it symbolically, figuratively. All right? Now, these interpreters, this letter B, uh, the 144,000 are symbolic of the church during the days of the tribulation. These interpreters may or may not believe in a restoration for ethnic Israel. But they believe that this number is not to be taken literally, and it is symbolic of the entire group of God's faithful in the last days. Uh, let me quote to you one individual who holds this last position. He is, he is a historic premillennialist, a futurist, a premillennialist, a historic premillennialist, but he believes that this 144,000 represents all the people going through, and that is this man, Robert Mounts. Robert Mount says this, the last generation church, not a select group, but the full number of the faithful believers alive when that event takes place. And, and he is not a fool. Robert Mounts is a respected, uh, you would agree with much of what he writes. He loves the Lord every bit as much as you and I do, agree with him or not. But that is his position. Histor- I believe, I hold again, I hold that this historic premillennial position, that letter A, I believe that these 144,000 are literally 144,000, 12,000 from each of these tribes. That is my position. The question I ask simply is this, is what if we just come to this text, rather than guessing at what it means, let's just take it exactly as it's stated. We read those verses, what do they say, and what do we come away with? Verse 4, I heard the number of the sealed. 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Who is Israel? What were his tribes? How many were there? Well, that's what the text says. It says verses 5 through 8, 12,000 from the 12 tribes. We know Israel. We know who Israel is. Israel was that son of uh, Isaac that was Jacob. His name was changed to Israel. Jacob had how many sons? Had 12 sons. We refer to these 12 tribes of Israel. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes that are listed here in these pages for us. Each one specified. It's almost tiresome in its repetitiveness. You know, when when you read through that, some of us, you know, when when we read through our Bibles, some of you may have a Bible reading plan where you read through your Bibles, say maybe once a year, and you get to a spot with a lot of names. And you just... Everything in you just wants to skip right through those. Why? Because there's kind of a tiresome monotony to them. And that's when you get to verses 5, 6, 7, 8, 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000. You know, why couldn't they just say 12 from all these tribes? But the Lord inspired John in writing these words out exactly as he did for us. With this, mono- with this, with this explicit get to a spot with a lot of names. And you just, everything in you just wants to skip right through those. Why? Because there's kind of a tiresome monotony to them. And that's when you get to verses 5, 6, 7, 8, 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000. You know, why couldn't they just say 12 from all these tribes? But the Lord inspired John in writing these words out exactly as he did for us with this, mono- with this, with this explicit detail given to us. Now, I hold to this literal position. I just share with you that letter A, that is the position I hold. I'm not asking you to hold it. You may not. But that is, that is what I hold to. Now, there are arguments, as you can imagine, against that. And I want to address those. And hopefully tonight we'll get through these. I don't know what our time is going to do, but we'll get as far as we can and we'll quit when we have to. But the arguments against taking it literally, there are people who don't. And again, there are lots of arguments, folks. Again, page after page, chapter after chapter, not chapter after chapter, but lots of pages. These are the main ones. Right, there are more, but these are the main ones. Number one, the list begins with the tribe of Judah. That's an argument against taking this literally. Because it says in verse 5, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. Class, what should be the first tribe listed? Anybody know? Who was Jacob's oldest son? First one born to Leah. His name was Reuben. So Reuben should be first, right? Who should be next? After Reuben. Right? Simeon should be next. Who's next? If, if it's not Reuben, if it's not Simeon, then who's next? Levi is next. Right? 
Judah is his, first, is his fourth son. So some commentators come to this and say, Aha! We can't take this literally because the list is odd. It starts with Judah. And it should start with Reuben. That, that's the case. Uh, so they cast suspicion on a literal interpretation. Uh, they say that maybe there is some symbolic, uh, hidden meaning, because the list begins with what they believe to be the wrong son. All right? Now, the answer to that is this. I don't know what you do with your spare time, but I spent a couple of days just going through the Old Testament lists of these tribes. And I came up with, and it's not a hard thing to do, you just get, it, get yourself a concordance and get a Bible software program and type in a couple of these names and, and you can come up with the lists if you just spend a little time. I came up with 26 listings of these tribes in the Old Testament, just the Old Testament. 24 of them I, I consider a little bit more legitimate. There are a couple that there are just too many sons missing to make it a list that's might, that might be intended to be the lists of the tribes. Now, I'll explain that in a little. But 26 lists, 26 different lists that I came up with, 24 intentional listings of the tribes of Israel. Out of those 24, 26 lists, how many in the Old Testament do you think begin with the name Judah? Eight. Eight times in the listings in the Old Testament, when the tribes are listed, Judah's first. Not Reuben. In, uh, if you, don't want, you want to jot them down, I'll give them to you. I'm not going to go to them. Just go, if you want to jot them down. The first one is in Numbers. Three times in Numbers. Chapters 2, 7, and 10. And if you're, familiar, if you're familiar with Numbers, you know that that's the listing of what? That's the listing of the encampments. When they encamped around that tabernacle through the wilderness journeys. Judah's first in all three of those lists. In Joshua 21, there are two listings. And it's this, it's this giving of the, of the cities for the Levites. You remember all of that history. Twice. It's in Joshua chapter 21. Both times starts with Judah. And three times in First Chronicles. Chapters 4, 6, and 12. Judah is named first. So it is not odd to have Judah first. It is not a weird thing. Uh, in fact, there are two times in the Old Testament where someone else is named first. In Deuteronomy 27, Simeon is first. And in Ezekiel 48, Ezekiel 48 is that prophecy of what? What's Ezekiel 48? All of you familiar with Ezekiel 48's prophecy? That's that prophecy of what? The future kingdom. Right? That future kingdom and the divvying up of that land among the tribes. Guess whose name is first? Dan is first. Whose name is missing in this list? It's Dan. But in Ezekiel 48, he's right there heading the list. Anyways, I'm just sharing with you this point. The answer to that is this. It is not uncommon to have Judah listed first. Right? It is not uncommon. Another argument. Another argument. Number two. The order of the names is irregular. Right? The, the order is, is, is funny to some of these people. Not only does it begin with the wrong son, but the list is in an order that is not found elsewhere. Nor else in your Bibles will you see this list exactly like this. The answer to that is simply this, folks. There are 26 times in the Old Testament, at least by my count. And so anybody who has actually done this, if you've done it and I'm wrong, show me. I'll, I'll fix it. But of the 26 times in the Old Testament that I came up with where the sons are listed, there are 19 different arrangements of those names. You won't, you, there are some that are exactly the same. Those encampment names, it's the same. The list is the same each time. But there are 19 different ways in the Old Testament that these lists are given. So if you're going to say that this is an irregular order of the names, you'd have a difficult time proving that when there doesn't appear to be a regular way of listing them in the Old Testament. Number three. There's a tribe missing in the list. We talked about that a second ago, didn't we? Dan. Well, we can't take this literally because Judas first, never mind the fact that he's first in eight other lists. We can't take it literally because uh, the order is odd, never mind the fact that it's odd throughout every listing. And thirdly, Dan is missing. 
So you can't take this seriously because Dan is missing. Uh, there are other lists in the Old Testament where there are tribes missing. And yet all of Israel is meant. And yet there's a tribe missing in the list. Let me give you a, a couple of examples of those. Uh, if you just want to jot them down. Do I, are, is it on your list? Did I give you the list of just, just these answers? I didn't give them to you. If you want them, I'll give them to you. One is in Deuteronomy 33. In that list, that's the list of Moses giving out the blessings. Moses is blessing all the tribes of Israel. And he lists them out and he gives them these names and cries out blessings for Reuben and blessings for Levi and blessings for da- David. Uh, David. <laughs> A Dan, a blessings for all these sons. No blessing for Simeon. Simeon's missing in that list. And yet we understand that that is a blessing for all of Israel, and yet Simeon's missing. But no one I know takes that list figuratively in Deuteronomy 33. Everyone takes that list literally. Judges chapter 5. Judah and Simeon are missing. And in that list, Ephraim is first. In 1 Chronicles 7, Dan and Zebulun are missing. And in 1 Chronicles 27, Gad and Asher are omitted. And yet in each case, all the tribes are listed. All the tribes except those are meant in this description of all the tribes. And yet there are tribes missing. So it's not odd. It is not unique to find a tribe missing in these lists. Other lists have tribes missing as well. That's the answer to that. And you should have that on. I know you have that on your, on your sheet there. All right? Number four. There are oddities regarding the tribe of Joseph. Now, let me hopefully not confuse you more. Most of you are aware Israel had how many sons? Twelve. When the land was divided up, it was divided up into twelve tribes. Except one tribe didn't get any land. What tribe is that? Levi. The Lord is their inheritance. So now that only leaves you with 11. The way this is handled is the land is divided by whose two sons? Joseph's two sons. Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so those lands are divided up among the 12 sons. Joseph isn't listed. Levi isn't listed but the other, you have the other 12. See how that goes? You, you have 14 altogether. All right. Can I confuse you? Really confuse you? Because you have 14, you've got, you've got all the 12 sons, plus Ephraim and plus Manasseh. But because Joseph isn't named and e- Levi doesn't get a land portion to him, you now have 12 if you include Ephraim and Manasseh. Everyone with me so far? Don't fall. I will see toothpicks in your eyes. Okay, so that's what's going on. Usually, Joseph is missing. But the names of his two sons are used to take his place, Manasseh and Ephraim. The tribe of Levi is often excluded because the tribe received no inheritance of land. But in this case, the tribe of Levi is included. If you look at that list, all right, look at verse 7, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi. Uh-oh. Now what are you going to do? If you have the other 12 plus Levi, how many is that? Now it's going to end up, you're going to have 13. Then look down to verse 8. 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph. Oh man, now if you have Ephraim and Manasseh, now you have 14 tribes. You have all these tribes. Well, you've got Dan missing, so now that brings us to 13. And Ephraim and Manasseh. Well, if you will look at verse 6, it says 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. So who else is missing? Ephraim. Right, Ephraim. So, if you're not thoroughly confused... This is one of the reasons that they say you have to take this figuratively. You can't take it literally because of these oddities, especially this one regarding Joseph. Well, and by the way, if, how many of you are familiar with, you're probably not familiar with Greg Beal, Greg Beal's commentary. If you'd like to read about 10 or 12 pages on this, uh, his commentary has, has like 12 pages on this that I also skipped over. Uh, the answer is simply this. We find something similar to this in Numbers 13 when Moses is arranging for men to spy out the land of Canaan. In Numbers 13, you have Joseph named in the place of Manasseh. 
Now, Manasseh's name is used, but you have the 12 tribes. Remember, there was one person from each of the tribes to go into the land and form a party to spy out the land of Canaan, one from each tribe. And those tribes are listed. And then it says, one from the tribe of Joseph. And then it says, that is, Manasseh. It doesn't say that with Ephraim. It doesn't say one from the tribe of Joseph, that is, Ephraim. No, it says Joseph in place of Manasseh, or for Manasseh, even though Manasseh's name is there. So the arrangements uh, are, are there's, there's this oddity about Joseph in that list as well. All I'm saying is that, there, that this list in Revelation 7, and these irregularities and this oddity about Joseph, is not unique to this list. It's found elsewhere. It's found in Numbers chapter 13, at least. at least. And there may be other places. That's the only place I was able to find it in my study. There may be more. So, the arguments against a literal interpretation based on certain oddities about the list in Revelation are, in at least my opinion, they're just not compelling. I, I don't find them compelling. Uh, here's one more. Number five. The number 12,000 from each tribe is too uniform. Or it's too neat as they say. You know, Twelve patriarchs, uh, twelve apostles, twelve from each tribe. This, this is just too neat to be taken literally. It must be a metaphor of some kind. It must be taken figuratively. And so they say that it is suspicious that the number 12,000 is repeated for each tribe. Some believe that larger tribes would have larger numbers. Smaller tribes would have smaller numbers, Right? Uh, I remember when they did the counting in the Old Testament of these tribes? They'd count so many over the age of 20. Such and such a tribe had so many thousands. And another tribe that was smaller would have less. And remember, even Paul himself said, I am a, 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 a Jew from the tribe of what Benjamin, being a small tribe, a little tribe, and would have less. So those who would look at this list and say, this is wrong, they should have like a lot from one from Manasseh because it was a big tribe and a little bit from Benjamin because they were a much smaller tribe. And then reflecting the size of the tribes throughout the list. So this is too suspicious that you have this uniformity of number is how someone has said it. However, this uniformity of number is also seen in the Old Testament. And I think in your notes, you need to fix something do you have this line, however, this uniformity of number? You have the word is there. It's crossed out that first is. Right, that's just a mistake. However, this is. It's crossed out that first is. However, this uniformity of number is also seen in the Old Testament. Let me give you a couple of examples of these. In Numbers 7, Numbers chapter 7, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you. In Numbers chapter 7, the tribes bring their offerings to Moses for the tabernacle. Here it is in Numbers chapter 7, beginning in verse 12. He who offered his offering the first day was Nashon, the son of Amminadab, of the tribe of Judah. So Judah is listed first in this bringing of offerings to Moses for the tabernacle. And all the tribes will be listed. Verse 13. And his offering was one silver plate, whose weight was 130 shekels. One silver basin of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. One golden dish of 10 shekels full of incense. One bull from the herd. One ram. One male lamb. A year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering. And for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old. That's for the tribe of Judah. Some of you in your Bible reading, as you're trying to read through your Bibles once a year, you come to this, and now you're going to read that over and over and over again, exactly the same. Every tribe, same number. When you get to the tribe of, when you get to the tribe of Simeon, his offering, one silver plate, whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver basin, Judah, all of these tribes, Manasseh, Issachar, all of them the same over and over and over and over. Eighty-nine verses in chapter 7 with this repetition, no matter the size of the tribe. 
in Numbers 13. I don't have this on the screen, just for your own edification if you want to jot it down. Numbers 13, we saw one man from each of the tribes chosen to spy out the land. Uniformity of numbers. Uniformity of numbers. In 1 Chronicles 23, David numbers the Levites, and he assigns 12,000 to serve in the tabernacle, 1,000 every two weeks, 48 weeks. So it's this uniformity of numbers. So you've got 1,000 of the priests serve for two weeks, then another 1,000 for another two weeks, then another 1,000 for another two weeks, and this, this repetitiveness, uniformity of number. In 1 Chronicles 27, David is making arrangements for the military officers over the tribes, and he is choosing out men to be leaders militarily over these tribes. And there is exactly the same number from each tribe, 24,000. Every time. Now, no one takes any of that figuratively. When it says David numbered the Levites and assigned 24,000 of them to serve in the tabernacle, no one says, well, that has to be symbolic because it's just too neat of a number. And yet, people will come to this passage in Revelation and say, well, it's got to be figurative because 12,000 from each tribe, I mean, that's just too neat. Sorry. Again, this is not unprecedented. It's happened in the Old Testament where the tribes are listed and there's uniformity of number assigned to each one of them. It does have Old Testament precedent. Now, you would have a difficult time again saying, I say this, to prove that this number must be taken figuratively based on just these irregularities. Now, the last point I want to make is a lengthy point and it is an important point and my time is really coming to an end so I don't want to begin it tonight. So we'll begin it next week. There is a larger issue at stake here in my mind regarding the literal literal understanding of these Jewish people in this day. Now, I know I've given you a lot of stuff, a lot of numbers. I I hope it wasn't dry. I'm just trying to make a point. These are 144,000. Take it just as it says. Any thoughts? Any questions you might have regarding what we've looked at tonight and uh, these... 12,000. And the arguments presented and the answers to those arguments. Anyone have a, a different argument that I have not mentioned? I, I, I spoke last week with an individual in our, in our congregation who, who holds to a little bit more of a, uh, a figurative understanding of this. Um, trying to find any other arguments that we might want to answer. All right, if not, then let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together and for the opportunity to look into your word and to uh, seek for an understanding of what it says to us regarding these future things. Please, dear Lord, bless to our hearts what we have learned tonight and to uh, take your word as it stands uh, unless there is compelling reason to take it symbolically or figuratively or to understand it as a metaphor. Dear Lord, please bless in our time of prayer commit ourselves into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.